All right, we started. So welcome everybody. Uh, before we start today's talk, we would like to quickly announce actually we have some very good news with regards to the uh, brainstorm sessions, the affiliated event that you're equipped. Uh, so we have uh, very generous funding from IBM and the Swiss National Science Foundation to provide a number of stipends to students who will otherwise not be able to attend. Uh, we'll send an email with some more information after this session, and you can also find it on the website for these uh, for the brainstorm sessions. So if you uh, want to attend brainstorm sessions, but you wouldn't be able to through, because of your funding, then please reach out to us with, with the information and uh, we will get back to you uh, before the, uh, the, the early registration ends. Uh, with that, let's go to today's uh, talk. So today we have uh, Gabrielle Scollard from Penn State, uh, who is a last year PhD student with Kirsten Eisentrager. And she will talk about connecting uh, Kani's lemma uh, and Duhat Tietz trees to compute endomorphism rings. So Gabriela, uh, the floor is yours. Excellent. Um, hello, everyone. Um, OK, let me know. I don't know if anything horrible happens. You can't hear me. You can't see the slides. Um, I don't know, something like that. OK, um, so I'm talking about um, connecting Connie's lemma and the Bruja Tits tree to compute endomorphism rings of super singular elliptic curves. Um, so um, I'll say um, a little bit about the endomorphism ring problem. Let's see, it's kind of lagging. Okay, um, so um, uh, uh, so um, given a super singular elliptic curve E defined over FP squared, we want to compute its endomorphism ring. Um, and I, I don't know. I hopefully I saw Jenny Club. Most of you are convinced this is an interesting problem already, uh, equivalent to um, pathfinding problem in the L isogeny graph, um, stuff like that. So I didn't spend that much time uh, trying to convince you guys that's convinced that's interesting. Um, so I'm just gonna say, what is this problem? Uh, we want to compute a basis for the endomorphism ring. That means give four like linearly independent um, endomorphisms. Okay, and if, if you don't know why there's like four, that I'll, I'll explain a little bit later. Um, uh, and then kind of how does this work? Because usually there's two steps. Um, step one is compute a basis for a full rank subring. So four linearly independent um, uh, endomorphisms. And then step two is make it big enough that's actually the full ring. So from the full, from, from the subring compute the endomorphism ring. Um, it's kind of the way it, uh, you can think of this process. And um, our work uh, that I'm, we'll talk about today gives a polynomial time algorithm for step two. It doesn't really say anything about step one, um, using repeated applications of Connie's lemma to compute the endomorphism ring locally on the Bruja Tits tree. And I'll explain all of those words. Um, step one is still like hard. Like I think, Somebody in the chat probably knows way better. Somebody over here probably knows way better than me. But I think like step one is like square root of p, like complexity still. But so this is just about the step two portion. Um, okay, so that's kind of what we're trying to do. Um, sorry, that slide got repeated. And so kind of as an outline um, of what we'll talk about. So we'll talk about Connie's lemma. I think Connie's lemma like came up in a bunch of previous talks. So um, I'm not going to spend that much time on it either because that's sort of like not the main part of the paper. Um, then I'll give a little bit of background on quaternion algebras and the bruja Tits tree, um, just sort of just enough to sort of describe what this algorithm does. Um, mostly, I'll say this is kind of going to be mostly in a, the simplest case and then the kind of most general case that we're doing in the paper. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll get into it, but it's, it's a little bit technical to see kind of why it all works. So I'll mostly describe it in the simplest case and I'll give you a bunch of pictures and try to convince you that the general case um, is just the simple case, uh, but more interesting. Okay. Um, so, okay. Um, so Connie's lemma, 
um, is if you have this uh, sort of two factorizations of um, an isogeny, um, you get sort of this, like a community diagram like this, and you have these degrees are the same, and these degrees are the same, um, then you can construct a higher dimensional um, isogeny of degree, the sum of their degrees. And I shouldn't be saying degrees. When I say degrees, that's really me using the terminology for like what is Connie's lemma that Connie originally stated was for elliptic curves. So Connie proved this when A, A1, A2, and B in this diagram are elliptic curves. And then kind of in Damien Robert's um, like breaking SIDH and polynomial time paper, like one of the things that's like that's given there is generalized for um, you can do this for abelian varieties. And in that case, you don't want the degree to be DI, you want it to be like a DI isogeny. Um, so yeah, okay. So Okay, yeah, so so then since I said that, I actually there's like a minor typo here. Uh, so these should be like DI isogenies. Um, anyway, this is the, these, these should be D1 isogenies and then these should be um, D2 isogenies. Okay. All right, already a typo. Hopefully, hopefully that's kind of the the only kind of main thing. Um, anyway, so the how how does this work? It, um, for us is it sort of gives um, an algorithm. I'll just call it algorithm one for the purposes of this talk, um, which is given an endomorphism um, and an integer. You can determine if beta divided by n um, is an endomorphism. Um, this was used by Robert to um, give an algorithm for computing endomorphism rings of ordinary elliptic curves, where um, it really is just like you want to see, um, you have a generator for your, uh, you have the generator like the Frobenius, and then you want to see kind of um, to get all the other things, you can just sort of scale generators. To get all the other possibilities for endomorphism rings, you can just scale the generator and like test it to see if it actually is an endomorphism or not. Um, and then, uh, and I also have this reference for Wazilowski and um, Herlid on Le Merdi, um, which they give like it really, like they give a, a detailed proof and analysis in their paper. So we're just using it um, for the most part. Um, and so I'm not gonna say that much about how it works, only that um, um, it uses Connie's lemma um, and the interesting thing is that you can do this in polynomial time. So you can determine um, if a rational multiple of an endomorphism is still an endomorphism um, in polynomial time is where polynomial time kind of there's lots of details of kind of what goes into that but um yeah okay so this is kind of the main tool we're going to be using a bunch of times um and how are we going to be using this um so oh, okay so let me tell you kind of some other people who have used this towards like similar purposes uh and then I'll tell you how we'll use it so first like I said Robert used this or like describe this um, to compute endomorphism rings of ordinary elliptic curves um, in a, in the preprint um, that is that will be cited at the end of this um, slideshow. Um, it's also used in work which relates endomorphism ring computation to knowledge of a single non-scalar endomorphism. Um, so there's these two papers, one is by uh, Erledon, Lemerdi, and Wazilowski, and the other one is by Page and Wazilowski. Um, they can probably tell you a lot better what their paper does, uh, but um, I think this one in particular really does compute um, the endomorphism ring from a single non-scalar endomorphism 
but sort of the technique is different where they're sort of doing more of that step one, com like computing um, like a suitable subring and then like doing this, like uh, using this algorithm one to sort of enlarge it. Um, but again, I think I think one of the authors at least is on this Zoom call, so they can correct me if I'm completely off base. <laughs> um, okay, so just want to bring up. So this is this kind of tool, like, is a rational to determine is a rational multiple of an endomorphism still an endomorphism. It's kind of been used um, a lot, so uh, it's pretty powerful. Um, okay. Um, and, uh, so kind of what does this give us? So the, the way, main way we're going to use it is, um, we get sort of a global test. If you have an order, uh, in the like endomorphism ring tensor Q, what I mean by that really is just that all the basis elements are of the form beta divided by N where beta is an, endo, uh, is an endomorphism, then we can efficiently determine if um the order is contained in the endomorphism ring just by of course you can just test each basis element um so and really the main way we're going to use this is not actually this global test we're going to use a, what i'm going to call a local test and i'll kind of explain how that works kind of in a little bit not, not exactly how the test works i'm just going to sweep all those details under a rug that you can ask me to like lift up and kind of say more later but um i'll kind of explain this like global to local um interchange that we're doing here but essentially this will also give us a local test which tells us um if you have a local order which um is contained in the endomorphism ring like tensor uh qq then we can efficiently determine if lambda, the local order, is contained in the endomorphism ring tensor ZQ. Um, and the way we do it is sort of essentially just use the global test for an appropriate global order that we can compute um, explicitly. So being able to compute it is sort of like the detail that I'm sweeping under the rug. Um, but hopefully that's like believable because sort of at some point I'm just going to say we can do this. <laughs> um, so that's the main thing is that we now have like a local test. Um, okay. Okay, so then, so I'm gonna talk about now this sort of global to local thing. Um, so we'll set some notation just to, um, so we're all like on the same page. So we'll have BP infinity be the quaternion algebra over Q, which is ramified at P and infinity. Um, if you don't know, uh, much about the about quaternion algebras, you probably do because uh, because of the connection to super singular elliptic curves and endomorphism rings. But if you don't, all I, all I need you to know about it for this like portion in the global setting is just like it's a non commutative rank four algebra over Q. Um, and then we'll and then uh, I'll say more later in the local setting about the important stuff. Um, so, um, and of course, if, if you read John Voigt's book, if you don't know anything about quaternion algebra, it's great. Okay. Um, so, and then from now on, we're going to assume we're given um, a full rank subring of the endomorphism ring. Um, and then a factorization of the quantity, the reduced discriminant of O0, which I won't tell you anything about this. It's just, it can be computed from the basis and later I'll say why we need it. Um, so the structure of the endomorphism ring, well, the endomorphism ring will be isomorphic to a maximal order in BP infinity. Um, and it'll be equal to a maximal order in O0 tensor Q, where O0 is like our, um, our thing that is that has a basis which is only endomorphisms, that we know are endomorphisms. Um, so we're looking for uh, something in O0 tensor Q, an order, a maximal order in O0 tensor Q, and it should also contain O0. Um, and then 
so some previous work I also want to mention because it sort of is also like influencing like how we um, like kind of our approach to it, to this problem um, by Eisentrager, Holgren, Leonardi, Morrison, and Park um, is to compute endomorphism rings. Um, or so they computed endomorphism rings by computing all the maximal orders containing O0, so sort of the exact same setting, and then testing that each one is isomorphic to the endomorphism ring. Um, they require some restrictions on the O0 so that there are not exponentially many orders to test that we kind of um, will we'll show kind of how we like how we uh, ad address this. Um, but uh, and I should say, I want to add this, actually type this in the slide, but I don't think I actually ended up doing that. Um, I'll say what they're using is that really they're computing. Um, so they computed all uh, local maximal orders. Um, containing O0. And then um, they combine them to get global maximal orders, all global maximal orders containing O0. And then they like test that each if each one's isomorphic to the endomorphism ring. Um, so there's sort of from there, we also um, address this problem locally. Um, and so we're kind of using this local global principle, which just says uh, the global order will be determined by its completions at each prime. Um, so that means to compute the endomorphism ring, we're just gonna compute the endomorphism ring at each prime. Um, and maximality is a local property. We're after a, um, a maximal order. So we're after a maximal local order as well. Um, which contains our like starting order. Um, and so we don't have to like, so uh, we only have to like deal with finitely many um, primes because um, our starting order is already maximal at all the primes except those dividing uh, the reduced discriminant divided by P. So the only primes we have to worry about where it's not already equal to the endomorphism ring, um, the local endomorphism ring will be exactly at those primes dividing D over P. Um, and then there's also only one maximal order in BP infinity tensor QP. This is related to, I mean, this is related to the fact that um, it ramifies at P. So, the only like the, so the interesting case that um, we're going to talk about is where the prime Q is not equal to P. Okay. So um, so now we're going to switch to like the local setting, and now essentially like if you didn't know anything about quaternion algebras, now is the part where I'm like going to tell you like stuff about quaternion algebras that you like kind of need to know to understand the rest of the talk. Um, so if we're going to assume Q is not equal to P, um, and we're going to be working in, so BP infinity tensor Q, Q, if, since Q is not equal to P, uh, will just be matrices with over Q, Q. Um, and then all maximal orders will be conjugate to M2, Z, Q, so matrices over Q adic integers. Um, and then from now on, I'm not going to talk about like the O0 tensor QQ. So like um, what I mean is that, so this object, the O0 tensor QQ, this lives in like the endomorphism ring tensor QQ and like has a basis specified by endomorphisms and stuff. But all this stuff about Bruja-Titz trees is going to be about orders um, in matrix in M, uh, sorry, in M2QQ. So we're gonna assume we have an isomorphism that takes us from this world to like matrices. 
So kind of from now on, all my notation, I'm going to be talking about matrices uh, or orders, um, maximal orders in this ring um, rather than endomorphisms. Um, and again, sweeping a bunch of details under a rug to say that there is such an isomorphism that, that, that we can compute like nicely. Um, okay, so now our notation is going to be lambda zero will be the image of O zero under this isomorphism. Um, and lambda E is going to be the image of the um, endomorphism ring tensor ZQ. So um, let me see. Yeah, and any orders we refer to will be orders in M2QQ. So the idea now and is our goal is to find lambda e um, among orders, oops, orders containing um, lambda zero. And I mean maximal orders containing lambda zero. So that's kind of, now that's what we're after is how do we find lambda e um, among these orders? Um, I also mention we have this condition on the isomorphism being that it maps O0 into M2ZQ. Um, that's just, uh, that's so we sort of have a starting point. Um, and that won't make any sense until I show the next slide, but I'll just kind of point that out that we have this condition that we're mapping O0 into a particular maximal order um, that we know will be one of the maximal orders containing lambda zero. Okay. Okay, so now I'll tell you about um, the bruja tits tree. So this is a graph which organizes the maximal orders of M2QQ. Vertices will be maximal orders, and then there will be an edge between two maximal orders if the index um, of uh, the intersection in one or the other. So I was just kind of lazy, so I only wrote one, but it kind of, but it doesn't matter. So this index will be um, Q. And just some properties. This is a Q plus one regular tree. Again, for isogeny people, so we know what those look like, um, or we know what Q plus one regular means. <laughs> um, so the degree at each vertex will be Q plus one. Um, the distance between lambda and lambda prime is the length of the unique path between them. So this is a, de a definition, um, but it for a tree, uh, there will only be one path to think about. So this will be the unique path between them, um, the length of the unique path between them. And then um, this is kind of a mouthful but every maximal order can be written uh, as a conjugate of M2ZQ and sort of the matrix that you're conjugating by encodes the steps of the, of the path between M2ZQ and lambda. I'll have a picture that maybe makes it um, more clear as well. And then kind of the final fact um, that I'll state is that the set of maximal orders containing a full rank order is a finite subtree of the bruja tits tree. Um, so it'll be a, a subtree. In particular, it's like it's a connected um, thing. So um, let's see. Uh, okay, I, I won't say too much more about it, but um, the graph of maximal orders containing lambda zero. Um, is kind of nice. It's not going to jump around uh, the Bruja tits tree. Um, so let me show you what this looks like uh, in a kind of small example. So here's like a truncated Bruja tits tree for Q equals to three. So in general, this is an infinite tree. So I'm truncating it and just saying that we're only going to walk um, two steps from this node. Um, the vertex labels in this graph. So I took this from the from the um, paper directly, where kind of a lot of this notation is explained a lot more. Um, so I'll just say the vertex labels are products of matrices, um, and the 
each of the matrices sort of corresponds to a different step. So like from the identity, you could pick gamma zero, or you could pick gamma one, or gamma two, or gamma infinity. And these are kind of the, the subscript and the infinity, like these, these like mean something, but it, it doesn't really matter for this presentation what exactly they mean. They just correspond to like a step in the graph. Um, and then the vertex labeled gamma corresponds to the order gamma inverse M2ZQ gamma. And so kind of all I want you to get out of this is that maximal orders can be represented um, explicitly in terms of like where they're located on the tree. So um, we can sort of encode this information about the path and that tells us what the order is um, in terms of how exactly it conjugates like M2ZQ. Okay, so um, the uh, sort of uh, the special case I'll talk about is related to this um, intersection of two maximal orders. So if lambda one, lambda two, and lambda are maximal orders, then lambda will contain lambda one intersected with lambda two if and only if lambda lies on the path between lambda one and lambda two. Um, okay, I see something in the chat, but I don't understand it. Uh, uh, I'm very sorry. Um, okay. All right, I'll, I'll, uh, okay. Um, okay, so, um, so sort of intersections of two maximal orders, you can, so any two maximal orders the intersection will be, uh, will correspond to like a path. Um, and all the orders containing that intersection will just be precisely that path. So, um, and then there'll be kind of a bunch of orders in between on the Bruja tips tree and all those vertices are exactly the orders containing lambda one intersected with, with lambda two. Um, so that's for intersections of two maximal orders. This is a very special case. Um, Intersection of three maximal orders, we can make a kind of more complicated statement for like how this um, interacts with like a region of the graph. Um, I'll just say, uh, and I'm not gonna make what that statement is. I'm just gonna say um, every finite intersection of maximal orders actually is an intersection of at most three maximal orders. So if you pick three vertices on the graph and then decide we want the intersection, um, of, or sorry, if, sorry, I, I shouldn't say that. I should say the other way. If you pick any finite number of vertices on the graph and you're going to take the intersection of them, then you get some kind of, um, then you'll get some intersection of at most three maximal orders. And this will correspond to some kind of neighborhood of a path um, with respect to the earlier defined distance. I'm not going to go into that much detail about that, um, but essentially saying, um, um, we also have this relationship between um, regions in the graph and intersections of three maximal orders, um, where the orders containing um, re relating regions of the graph or neighborhoods of a path, as I'm saying here, um, are exactly going to be uh, those containing like an intersection of three maximal orders. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna give the special case algorithm, which doesn't, which only uses this like two intersections of two maximal orders. So in the special case, if the subtree of orders containing lambda zero is a path, we can generate a list of the orders containing lambda zero and then perform a binary search to find lambda e. Um, and the length of the path, I'll just mention, it's at most the q adic valuation of the discriminant plus one, of the, of the reduced discriminant um, plus one. Um, so we have kind of, it's it's bounded in terms of the discriminant that we get. So just as an example, just to kind of describe what's going on. So if we know that the tree of maximal orders containing lambda zero is the path between lambda one and lambda seven, then lambda E is one of the lambda I on this path. So here is a picture. Um, and then secretly, 
I'm telling you that lambda four is what the one that we're after. So I'll show you how we would find lambda four or, or any of them. Um, so we do a local test because we know that lambda e is one is something on this path. So we know that lambda e is either here or here. Um, so equivalently, lambda e belonging to lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, lambda four. So this first group is just the same as saying that lambda e contains lambda one intersected with lambda four. Um, or you could have that lambda e belongs to this like second half. And that would be saying that lambda e contains lambda five, lambda six, and lambda seven. Um, so, um, so in order to figure out which half of the path it's on, we just have to do this local test. It does lambda e contain lambda one intersected lambda four, or does it? Or, and and so we just have to test one, of course, because it's going to be somewhere on the path. Um, so we do this local test, and we find that it's in this half. Oops. In this half. And so that cuts off like half the graph. And then you can see we can kind of just keep doing the same game. So lambda e is going to either be here or here. Um, so we test the first half. Um, we do our local test. We find that lambda e does not contain lambda 1 intersected with lambda 2. And that means that lambda e is going to be one of, um, wait, sorry, I think I like repeated a slide in a strange place. Okay, so that's going to say that lambda e is one of um, <laughs> lambda three or lambda four. And that cuts off that other half of the graph. And then um, we do this again for lambda three and lambda four, and we find lambda e because it's not going to be, it's not going to contain lambda three. Okay. So this is sort of the kind of nicest case that we could possibly have. Um, okay. Okay. Um, great. So that's the, that's the special case and kind of the, uh, the, the simplest case that I could describe it uh, coincidentally. So, but in general, um, it's not efficient to generate a list of all orders containing lambda zero. Um, we do have kind of a bounded region where we know lambda e belongs to just from the reduced discriminant. So sort of it, the way we kind of get around that we can't generate this list is that we don't care about generating this list of ours containing lambda zero. We just say from the reduced discriminant of lambda zero or the, or the reduced, reduced discriminant of O zero, um, we can tell kind of what part of the Bruja tips tree, like we, we already have a list of, a finite list of candidates. Um, so it'll be at most uh, the Qadic valuation of the reduced discriminant steps from, um, steps from the uh, M2ZQ. And then we're going to just use local containment testing for specially chosen orders to deduce information about where lambda E is on this graph. Um, so kind of what we were doing with this like path case only it's like not exactly as clear because they didn't explain um, what we're what information we actually get from it. Um, so but the kind of idea is that we're doing that same kind of idea but we're going to replace intersections of two orders with intersections of three orders which tells us kind of a bigger portion of the graph that we can sort of test uh, either rule out or rule like in um, whether or not it contains the endomorphism ring, local endomorphism ring. Um, and so I'm keeping it very vague uh, and I'll just say there are many more details in the paper um, with exactly how this like three intersections works and how, how we're using it. Um, I'll, I'll spell out also the general case and in a little bit of detail, which is sort of there's two steps. Um, we're going to compute the distance between the uh, M2ZQ and lambda E. 
um, which is kind of the nice step. Um, uh, yeah, so at most you'll have to um, essentially, uh, as soon as you like you test, um, as soon as you test an order kind of for this step, you kind of reduce the possible distance down by one and then you kind of, um, it's like pretty simple kind of, um, if your distance is like, I don't say it. Uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I have a picture that will kind of describe what's going on. Um, but this is sort of the not as costly step. For the second step, once you know that the um, what the distance is exactly, then you construct the path one step at a time. And by one step at a time, I mean we sort of we have like m two z q, and then you can test: did you go this way, this way, or this way? And so each one requires a different order that you're plugging in for the um, for the local testing. Whereas kind of for the distance, there's just one order that tells you, is it 10 from M2ZQ or is it nine from M2ZQ or is it eight from M2ZQ and so on. So it's sort of, um, so step one's not as bad. Step two is kind of the more costly step. So kind of, I don't know, if you can sort of like get lucky and like have your starting M2ZQ um, be not that far from the endomorphism ring, then that kind of would make things better. Um, okay. Anyway, so here's just a picture of what's going on and a sequence of pictures of what's going on. So say we had the, if the quadratic valuation of the reduced discriminant is four, um, then you know that the distance from lambda e to the reduced, or from lambda e to M2ZQ is at most four. Um, by you know, I mean, I, I told you and didn't tell you any proof or any like theorem, but we proved this in the paper. Um, so um, we do a local containment test for a particular order. We'll tell you that um, essentially that lambda E belongs to ever to one of these orders above this like purple curve that I'm drawing. So local containment test is saying that lambda E is above the purple curve. Meaning that the, and by that, of course, I just mean the distance is less than or equal to three. Um, and so that kind of cuts down, that throws out a bunch of orders just with one test. And then we do another local containment test corresponding to all the orders above this new purple curve. Um, and that tells us that, so we would find that lambda E does not contain the corresponding order. That means that lambda E is exactly a distance of three from, from M2ZQ. Okay. And then, so that tells us that um, so, so now, so that's sort of the distance step. And now we sort of start trying to recover the path. So lambda E is going to be like one of either we went like in the blue direction in the pink direction or in the like yellow direction. Um, I drew it of course for Q equals two, which is very small, uh, but you check Q plus one possibilities in general. Um, and each, each one requires a different test. And then lambda, and then kind of after checking the Q plus one possibilities, I guess you would only have to check Q of them um, because then, then you know like it must be in the last one or, or not. Um, then lambda E is one of, you find lambda E is one of these pink orders. So you know what the first step is. Um, and then you, then you get the second step. And in the Q equals two case, it looks uh, really nice, right? <laughs> but of course, Q could be anything. So you check, there's Q possibilities for what the next step is. And then you find it's like this pink direction. And then you check another Q possibilities. And then you find you have to take the pink direction again. And then our path length was three. So we found lambda E. Then lambda E kind of each of these choices corresponded to some choice of matrix. So really by found lambda E, we found like the matrix so that this is like gamma inverse M2ZQ. 
gamma. So like, and then kind of once we sort of work with our isomorphism, this actually tells us the endomorphism ring, um, like on the endomorphism ring side of things, what the like appropriate um, basis is um, for this like local endomorphism ring. Okay. Okay, so kind of, um, so that's sort of the, pretty much all I have. So uh, the the main takeaway is how does Connie's Lemma actually connect to this Bruhatitz tree pathfinding thing? So Connie's Lemma can be used to test containment of local orders in the local endomorphism ring, which we're calling lambda E, and then local containment testing can be used to find lambda E. Um, and sort of what's nice is this takes like, it's like linear in Q and this like exponent um, steps to rule out exponentially many orders, which are like Q to the VQ of D ish um, orders. So um, yeah, and that's, that's kind of it. Uh, if there are any questions, Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. <clears throat> um, as always, yeah, there's just the uh, writing questions in the chat if you have any or uh, or uh, or unmuting and asking them uh, as well. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the talk. It was a super cool, uh, super cool topic. Um, maybe I can start by asking a, a, a probably stupid question, but... Uh, <laughs> So as you said, like it's it's linear in Q, um, but how do you know that? How do you like bind the bound the size of Q? Like I think so. It depends kind of on this like O zero that you're given and what you're given. I don't, there there might be someone who in this Zoom meeting who knows better than me. But like for example, if your O zero is specified, like I think the way we sort of framed it in our paper is like O0 could be, for example, specified by um, two non-commuting endomorphisms, and then you can sort of compute um, their reduced the reduced discriminant of the order they generate, which would be like your O0. Um, and like, then you could sort of bound, I think in terms of the degrees, I think you need degrees and traces of the kind of starting endomorphisms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it will. Be, so it, it kind of depends. Like you might actually be given some like really garbage order to start with, right? <laughs> I <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> um, but typically, might, yeah. you will be kind of small. Yeah, I mm, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I I don't know. Depend. It depends. I think on. It depends on what you start with. Okay. But okay. I think kind of like in any like reasonable any reasonable like thing you would be given um am i reasonable i guess i'm like kind of assuming already that the q is <laughs> um yeah but in theory it could be i think large just uh like you can construct something bad but you can construct something good too like and i guess the other thing i want to say is sort of this like connie's lemma like portion of it i think is not at least in the way that we're we're talking about it with this like you need potentially four copies of the elliptic curve so you need this like four dimensional um isogeny i think there's not like and again probably somebody knows better than me <laughs> but i think th th this has not been like implemented um in, in like you know in general so sort of when q is small you have a much easier test to to see if like beta over n is in the endomorphism ring, you can just see if you restrict uh, beta to the n torsion, if this is like trivial. So I guess let's say equals zero. Um, so if n is like sm small, that computing torsion points is fine and evaluating beta is fine, then you don't have to do this like higher dimensional stuff, for example. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Uh -huh. 
uh, Sebastian also has a question. Uh, he asked, yeah. yeah, you can read the question yourself. Yeah, you. so what is the meaning of the indices of the gamma matrices? Um, okay, I should have, I don't have the paper right in front of me, so I might put them in the wrong order, but um, essentially, um, gamma C is going to be, let's see, I think it's going to be, well, maybe it's in the other one. It'll just be like a matrix that is like one, zero, C, Q. I don't know. It's lacking for me where like, I already wrote the matrix, but like just now it's like starting to show in the writing. Uh, on <laughs> so I hope, yeah, yeah. I don't know. So, um, yeah. So it'll be, I think it's like this. If it's not this, then it's like, then it's 1C0Q. And of course, by infinity, I don't mean that. I mean, uh, gamma infinity will be, um, sort of, uh, not quite an inverse to the gamma zero. Um, but kind of, it's, it's corresponding to like, you're picking sort of a, um, you can rephrase all this stuff in terms of lattices uh, over ZQ, and then it sort of corresponds to picking a different basis that will be like the kernel of your um, um, map from like one to the other. Is that how I want to say it? Yeah, so I don't know if that's like very enlightening. Um, okay, and then the question of... Uh, um, yeah, so then the question in here is, I don't understand how you use Connie's Lama. So kind of, mostly I'm using this like several steps <laughs> from the Connie's Lama jumping to this like um, thing that I'm calling algorithm one and then jumping to that from that to like this, uh, what I'm calling local test. Um, so like we have this algorithm one, which, is um, saying that we can test if the rational multiple of an endomorphism is still an endomorphism. And this uses Connie's lemma, uh, and I, I didn't say that much about it, with like this particular diagram. And um, yeah, so there's so there's this detailed proof and analysis that er Erledon, Lemurdi, and Wesolowski give um, for like how this all works um basically kind of like it kind of kind of at first glance it's like well what do you mean we don't even know beta over n is actually an endomorphism so kind of the thing is you sort of use this Connie's lemma to say if it were an endomorphism you would have this like four-dimensional um endomorphism that had that has this like a particular kind of matrix form and then you could find beta over n or you could find an endomorphism that acts exactly like beta over n um on like sufficiently large torsion that you can guarantee it actually is equal to beta over n basically so it's like it's a it's a lot going on in that in sort of how this algorithm and how this algorithm like actually is using connie's lemma um uh yeah so and then so once i have this algorithm, then I'm saying, um, because of this algorithm, we can test if a particular local order, um, which will be sort of, we're going to relate it to a global order by um, like a basis that will be essentially of the form like beta one over like some power of Q or something. Um, Okay, I don't need to put dot, dot, dot. That's just two more. <laughs> so once we have that algorithm, then sort of the local test is going to amount to, like I said, just going to be like a global test um, that is just going to test whether or not these like basis elements of the appropriate global order 
um, which will be essentially written like this, are going to belong to the endomorphism ring or not. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's that's definitely a detail I also swept under the rug <laughs> of how exactly this all works. Um, And then, is it possible to enumerate the minimal overorders of lambda and then check which ones are contained in lambda e? Um, this is a good question. I so I think kind of the way we do our algorithm is like we sort of we sort of throw away lambda zero once we have its reduced discriminant in some sense, like because we sort of testing if like each maximal order containing it, like that's gonna be too much, but sort of one way I was thinking that would make the algorithm faster, for example, is if you actually could get what the graph looks like. Um, but I, I don't know how to do that. Kind of this was one direction like Kristen and I were like thinking of for a little while is like, can we actually, figure out what this graph looks like. Um, these like, um, what is sort of the intersection of all maximal orders containing lambda zero, um, which will just be some by intersection of maximal orders, it'll be some intersection of three maximal orders. I don't, I don't know how to, uh, but yeah. So my answer is, I don't know, but <laughs> it's something I thought of, it's something I thought about. Um, I, I may have uh, an answer to that question. If I understand mm -hmm. it properly, um, Travis's idea is you have your order and you enumerate all the orders that are just one step bigger. So in which your original order has index Q, I guess. So this is um, what we do in the paper with Aurel Page, because we needed an mm -hmm. algorithm to do that in polynomial time. And it does work. It does solve the problem in polynomial time. But since you're enumerating everything, your complexity is cubic instead of linear. Mm -hmm. It probably get better than cubic. We get cubic because we enumerate all the over lattices without even checking if it's an order. If you save everything to enumerate only orders, maybe you can get something quadratic. Maybe not linear. I don't know. Okay, very cool. Um, thanks again so much for a great talk. Um, there are more questions and stuff. Uh, we can hang around a few minutes. We often hang around a few minutes after the meeting is officially over too, and people can ask maybe if they're afraid of asking questions or something. Uh, if you have time, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, nice. Uh, other than that, um, we will, as Kran mentioned at the beginning, we will email about the student stipends uh, after the meeting. So if you're interested in that, please look out for that. Um, otherwise, in two weeks, we will have uh, Arthur Lemerdi um, giving a talk which was on, on a paper, which was mentioned a few times here, where, where again, this, uh, this uh, testing with division, with endomorphism divided by, by, by some integer is actually an endomorphism. This algorithm comes up a lot too. Um, so stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, otherwise, thanks for thanks for now. <laughs> uh...